Well, welcome everybody to this meeting of the Poverty Reduction and Policy Development Committee. Um, we're holding this under the Local Authorities Coronavirus Meetings Wales Regulations. So this is a, uh, a live broadcast uh, which members of the public can, can view. Um, so we need to be careful about our meeting etiquette. Remember that we can't talk over each other and actually everybody will hear whoever is speaking more clearly if everyone else remains muted. So please mute yourselves and then just unmute when you're called to speak. OK, um, and our officer from Democratic Services is going to take a roll call now. OK. OK, uh, Councillor Mary Sherwood. Present. Councillor Ryland Doyle. Present. Councillor Peter Jones. Uh, present, but only with uh, sound. I don't have any video at the moment, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Erica Kirshner. Councillor David Phillips. Present. Councillor Christine Richards. Present. Councillor Kelly Roberts. And then officers Anthony Richards. Present. Lindsay Thomas. Present. Joe Portwood. Uh, present. And I'm Jeremy Parkhouse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeremy. I have, um, I believe Kelly is with us, uh, but she's going to have to leave at four o'clock. Can you give us a shout, Kelly? Are you there? No. I can see a little icon suggesting she's yeah. here. Uh, Kelly, if you can hear us, just um, chip in when you can. Give us a shout. Let us know if you're here or put a note in the chat box. Thanks. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Kelly, Kelly. Okay. okay. Um, and um, and um, Andrew um, Davis, uh, who uh, is our uh, 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 has been apologies today. Right, right. So the first task is to approve um, um, the minutes as a correct record. I have checked them and I'm happy with them. Can I have a seconder, please? Christine, thank you very much. So, um, Jeremy, you'll advise what we need to do to officially sign off the minutes. Okay. Um, I shall send them through to you. Um, so if you can sign them, scan them, send them back, that'll be fine. OK, Christine wasn't seconding the minutes. Go on, what did you want to say, Chris? You're muted, Chris. Christine, we can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Say, say that again. I was perfectly uh, happy to uh, second them, but then realised I wasn't actually there, so I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Could somebody I, I who was, was there second yes, them? I was, I was present, so I was second them. Thank you, Ryland. Thank you. Right, OK, are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? OK. We are going to have um, a presentation on a survey which has been drafted as a public consultation on the promoting affordable credit policy which this committee has developed. So we haven't seen this piece of work for a while. Committee members may recall that we put some work into developing this policy. It was completed back in January. It then got stuck in a bit of a, a backlog as things do. Um, with our very hard working but under resourced officer teams and of course the coronavirus crisis put a lot of this work on the back burner so we've we've brought it out now to find out what we need to do to move it forward towards being adopted as formal council policy and the next stage is that there needs to be um, a consultation so we've we've made an initial first draft um, and I'm, I'm glad that also in attendance at this meeting, we've invited Alison Pugh, who's the relevant cabinet member, um, to join in this discussion about uh, the survey that's been drafted. So Joe Portwood has prepared a presentation just to take us through the, the outline of the draft survey. So the working group will already have received this and had a look at it and had a chance to comment. Um, but I'm going to let Joe take us through the presentation and then we'll have a discussion. OK, over to you, Joe. 
Apologies, Mary, I didn't realise I was doing the presentation. Sorry, who's Sorry. doing the presentation? <laughs> Sorry, because the last the last thing I did, I, I sent you the um, translated document and sorry, I should have clarified whether it was you or me doing it. I just assumed that you would. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fair. One, one of us can do it. So um, is it is it is it as a PowerPoint? Did you send me it as a PowerPoint or as a Word document? No, sorry, sorry, it was just the word document. OK, but it's been translated in case anybody viewing wants to see it in Welsh. That's right, isn't it? Yes. OK, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just put it on my screen and we'll just have a read through it. So let me just find that now. Bear with me. Right, OK, so I'm going to try and open the two documents side by side, English version and Welsh version, and scroll through them. Thank you all for your patience while I dig this out. Now I'm able to find the translation, but not the English version. <laughs> we will get there, don't worry. and Welsh. I'm finding it difficult to align them both next to each other on my screen, but I'll do my best. I'm showing what is wrong. Mm. Am I? Oh, yes, I'm there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going to put this on the screen. Are you all able to see my screen? There's a Word document which says promoting affordable credit, survey draft one. Yes, thank you, Mary. OK. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through it in English. And then I'll put the Welsh version on the screen for a couple of minutes for any viewers who want to see the Welsh version. But I won't read through it. I'm afraid my Welsh probably isn't up to doing a good job of that. So the introductory text reads as follows. In Swansea Council, we want to change how we work when we hear that someone has money worries. Now, when people speak with the council about money problems, we might not do anything, particularly if the conversation was not really about money. For example, if someone who needed to get to a particular location mentioned to a council officer that they couldn't afford transport, the officer might not do or say anything about that. Money problems are something we want to step up and support people with. Anyone can fall into financial difficulty and an individual's money problems don't just affect them. Our local community thrives when people can afford healthy lives, support the local economy and avoid the stress of money worries. We want everyone who represents the council to understand this and to know how to ensure people Sorry, Mary, can I just interrupt you a minute? Yeah. Are you able to make it slightly larger with the slider on the bottom right hand corner? I can't read it even with my glasses on. How's that? That's better. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our local economy, our local community thrives when people can afford healthy lives, 
support the local economy and avoid the stress of money worries. We want everyone who represents the council to understand this and to know how to ensure people with money worries can get free independent help if they want it. There are very expensive ways of borrowing money. Some shops sell things with easy repayment plans, but the total cost is very high. Some lenders will come to your home to take repayments in cash, but again, the cost of these loans is very high. High costs take money out of people's pockets. We want to make sure people know about better ways to borrow money if that's what they need. The policy we've written explains how this will work and we would like your views on it. So that's the introductory text. <clears throat> and I'm going to put the Welsh version up for the benefit of the recording and any anybody who views it who would rather see the Welsh version. And I'll scroll through it slowly. OK, feedback that I've had so far on the introductory text is that um, where we've said council representatives, I think someone has suggested just being clearer and saying officers, council officers and councillors. My thinking was that there may at times be other people who represent the council who, or who are contracted to do work on behalf of the council who might not be officers or councillors. So we could have a little discussion about that. Um, and then we're going to go on to the actual questions of the survey. There are only six questions. I'm going to move back over to the English ones. OK. So the draft proposal. Has something happened? I can't hear Mary. Yeah. I'm oh. back. My internet. That was my internet. <laughs> right. I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So a, a piece of feedback from the working group who looked at this prior to this meeting was that I don't know. I don't know is always useful. Yes, no, don't know, and space for further comments. So here are the questions on the survey. Uh, question one, the policy is for council representatives. Again, we could change that to council officers, not for members of the public, but having read it, all the explanation above, do you feel clear about what it aims to do? Question two, do you think this policy is a good idea? Question three, have you ever spoken with a representative of Swansea Council about yourself or someone you support having financial difficulties? Question four, if yes, A, was their response helpful? B, do you think this policy would have made a difference? Question five, are there any other changes you think Swansea Council should make in the way it works with people in financial difficulties? And question six, would you be willing to work more with Swansea Council on its work to support people in financial difficulties? If so, please provide your contact details. So you'll see what we're trying to do here is take advantage of the opportunity to have a wider discussion with people about how the council could support them if they were in a low income situation. I'm going to put up the Welsh version of the questions. There we are. OK, so I'm going to open the discussion now on this draft document. I think that the. The working group all did receive the document and everybody who is here is in the working group, so you should all have a copy of this in your inboxes, which you could refer to so that I can put the screen back to the meeting now. OK. So does anybody have any um, 
questions or comments that they would like to make on the draft survey that I've just read through. David, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm a bit confused about question three. Seems to be in opposition to question one. Not for members of the public, but then we're asking council staff to act as members of the public because they're talking about their own experience of debt. Sorry, you've gone. Can't hear you. Sorry. The Promoting Affordable Credit Policy is a policy that has been written for internal use, for corporate use. It hasn't been written as a public document. So we're not necessarily trying to write the policy in a way that it makes exact sense to people. I hope that it would make exact sense to people, but more importantly, for the purposes of the survey, we want to make sure that respondents to the survey understand what the policy is trying to do. So we're saying that the policy hasn't been written for the public, it's been written for the council, but have we made it clear what the policy is trying to achieve? So that's what question one is about. Question three is asking the respondent if they ever have actually discussed their financial situation with somebody from the council. So we're asking council officers to say, have they discussed their own situation with council officers? Well, no, the, the, the survey is for anybody. The policy is for council officers, but the survey is for the public. This is a public consultation on a policy, which is a council policy. I'm confused then. Um, this is a policy that's internal. Yes. So these questions are related to what? This is a public consultation but on a draft it's, policy. But if it's a public consultation, what's question one got to do with it? And if it's not a public consultation because it's involving council officers, why have we got question three? Question one is asking whether the respondent understands the policy or understands what the policy is trying to achieve. It's a consultation. We're consulting on a draft policy. Yeah, but I'm not going to give it, yes, 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 but we're not going to give it to members of the public. Yes, we are going to give it to members of the public. The policy well, has saying been, it's not for members of the public at the top then. The policy is not for members of the public, but the survey is. But the survey then is asking them about something they're not going to get. The policy document is for internal use, but it's expecting council officers to work with the public if they disclose that they're in financial difficulty. Um, sorry, I think the questions are confusing then, because I still don't understand. There seems tension between questions one and three. If this is a document, this is a policy document for the council, and we're asking council officers, we shouldn't be asking council officers about their experience of debt. It's about whether as a council officer, the policy makes sense. Um, the survey is for the public. The survey well, is for the public. But I don't understand, therefore, why are we saying in question one, the policy is not for the members of the public who were consulting as part of the survey? All, all we're saying with question one is that it's an internal working document. That's all. But we can take that bit out if it's confusing. We can take that bit if, out and no, just no. say... If, we, if it hasn't been given to members of the public, how are they having read it? If they are reading it and commenting on it in this survey, then they must have been given it. And they've been given a document that we're saying it isn't for them. OK, but we, we do consult, we frequently consult on documents that aren't actually written for the public, don't we? We consult on internal policies all the time. And then there's a question mark over how how clearly understandable they have to be for members of the public who aren't going to well, work okay. into those policies. But it's fine. I think, I personally think that the policy is written very clearly in very plain English, which members of the public will understand. So I'm, I'm Can we make to... question, I understand, right, I think I'm getting there. Can we therefore make question one, 
a little clearer. We, we can get rid this, of this, this, this policy is to guide council representatives. Yes. Having read it, do, do you think it's clear that it, it, or it, it, it does what it's supposed to do, the council representatives will understand it? Because we're asking members of the public what they think members of the council, council officers will react to the policy. And frankly, I, to, I don't think that they'll know that. Yeah, that's not really the intention of question one. The intention of question one is to say, although this document isn't really for public view, it's for internal council use, do you nevertheless understand it enough to complete this survey? That's really what question one is trying to say. But I think I think we can do better than that. We don't need to apologise that it's a jargon filled internal document because it isn't. I think it's quite a clear, well written document that is understandable for the public. So why don't we just take out everything before do you? Why don't we just leave question one at do you feel clear about what this policy aims to do? Should we do that? Mm. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take it that we'll are do you, that. Are, we'll you, are, you, Got Chair, are, you, yeah. are you trying to have a vote here, love? Are you trying to have a vote? Because um, I, yeah, I understand why David was confused about uh, about question one. As he was speaking, I, I mean, I, I think you got to the nub of it. It's kind of, even though our policy is for council representatives, what do you think about it? Do you, you know, does it make it clear? You know what it's for and what it aims to do. I think you've said that, and whatever whatever words you want to use in in question one for that, I think that's fine. Does that help? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you, Christine. Peter, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. I was as confused as David. Uh, and I read this document several times trying to understand who it was aimed at and what it was trying to achieve. I would have thought a simple solution um, at the very top of the document, you should make, there should needs to be a statement. This is a survey of XX people um, with reference then across to the promoting affordable credit policy document. Had that been at the top, I think I would have understood it, notwithstanding the problem about question one and so forth. Um, but as it was, I couldn't understand who this survey was of. Was it of internal officers? Was it for the general public? Was it with or without the policy document to accompany it? I, I must confess, I was very confused. And I think, you know, we can sort that out. It's only a technical procedural thing. Simply by making clear in the opening of the survey draft who the survey is of and what it is a survey about. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. OK, thanks. So, um, well, just to recap and to be clear, the Promoting Affordable Credit Policy um, is an internal policy which we would expect councillors and council officers to be subject to. So it's important that they understand it and are prepared to work to it and follow it. But when we go out to a public consultation, we ask members of the public to consider the document and to answer the survey questions on it. So. There has always been a tension in council work when you're asking the public to comment on something that might relate to procedures or teams or processes that they're not familiar with and don't understand. And this can be alienating when you're asking the public to comment. So as a committee, I think we've got a decision to make about whether we try to make the policy very accessible and easy reading or whether we just say it's not meant to be accessible and easy reading, but here is an overview of what it's trying to achieve. Do you think it sounds like a good idea? Um, so I think obviously when the survey actually goes out, when it's actually live, it will be accompanied by the policy because that's always how we do our consultations. The policy will be there. And we've written this very easy reading, accessible introduction on the survey that is a kind of summary of what the policy intentions are. Um, so I, I think that once it's actually out there in context in real life, it will perhaps be clearer than it was to you when it landed in your inboxes. Um, 
but certainly the working group can continue to refine this until it's something that we're really happy to put out. That's not a problem. David, do you want to come in again? You're still on mute, David. Um, I'm going to be pedantic. Isn't the answer to question two automatically going to be yes? No. <laughs> some people, some people might complete this survey who never have spoken to anyone in the council about their financial situation. But they're, they're going to, no, the question two: Is anybody seriously going to say a policy for having affordable debt is a bad idea? Oh, I see what you mean. Do you think this policy is a good idea? I, I'm, I think I I'm, think I'm, I'm I'm very concerned always about public consultations. Because public consultations are inevitably always about getting the answers that we want, not the answers that we need. And when we frame the question, we have an intention as to what the answer wants to be. Because that's the way we frame the question. Um, so, you know, question four, four relates to question three. Um, so, have they? Have you spoken to it? In fact, three and four are the same question. It's not, they're not separate. Because question three is, 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 have you spoken to them? Yes. Well, you can't answer question four if you answer to question three. Three and four are the same question. Yeah. Um, but, so was their response helpful? No, but well, we're not asking them why not. And I don't think the sort of things you're going to trigger in these five questions are covered adequately by these five questions. Do you think, the, do you think this policy would have made a difference? Uh, possibly, I don't know. Um, I, 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 it, it, the, the sort of things that we want to get at about what the public need in terms of the council's attention to affordable debt, I think can't be dealt with by this sort of written consultation. I think it can only be dealt with by people talking to them face to face. Because you, I think some of these answers would need to be probed and, and teased out. Um, if in question 4A they say, was their response helpful? No. We need to know why not. Was it the attitude of the officer? Was it the lack of knowledge of the officer? Uh, or is it because the council's um, policy, um, its directive, direction in response to affordable debt is, in your view, completely misguided? And we're not asking them that. Well, we are asking whether there's other changes. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I agree with this takes an open view on the council having a policy. Um, okay, well, I mean, affordable debt is clearly very necessary, otherwise we're going to push people into criminality. Um, having the ability to borrow short term, even at high interest rates, is something that many people in the city have to do because that's the way they manage their finances. And we, what we should be doing is providing them with an alternative. And frankly, if the council is borrowing so much money to do things, we should actually borrow money to start doing some of this, rather than building bloody buildings. Actually, providing the people of Swansea with access to affordable debt at reasonable rates of interest, or, or even no rates of interest, would do a great deal more to address the issues of poverty in the city and county of Swansea than building a bloody arena. So the, the fact is that with, a, with a, any public consultation, council officers and people who might work, whose work might be affected by the policy, they will also have the opportunity to respond. Same as when the council puts out its consultation on the budget, we can all respond. You and I can go online and respond to that consultation. Council officers can go online and respond to the consultation. Now, I don't know, there might, there might be some people who think that this policy, for whatever reason, 
isn't a good idea. Now, ev what we're suggesting is that on every question, there is a, a space for further comments. We're not just asking yes, no. We are providing space for people to tell us more of a story if they want to. And then towards the end of the survey, it does ask if people want to contact us and provide their contact details so that we can have more of a discussion with them about how the council can support people on low incomes. So I am prepared for people to say that this policy isn't a good idea. I, do, I, I think it's a good idea. We all think it's a good idea. But the reason why we undertake public consultation is because we're prepared to hear something that we weren't expecting to hear. So I am prepared to hear that it's not a good idea. And I would hope that anybody who said no would give us more information in the comment box. We can enhance the text to prompt people to use the comment box. We can say, please explain more in the comment box if you would like to. We can include that on every question. You know, um, and it might be that people think that this policy falls short or doesn't put the effort where it's needed. You know, and really what we're trying to do with this survey, I think, is to open up a space for a discussion, you know, and that actually we're not we're not aiming. We're not trying to push people to say that this looks like a great policy, which we definitely must approve. We're inviting people to share their views on whether the policy as written is likely to help. Alison, you have your hand up. Uh, you want to come yeah, in? yeah, yeah. Only, sorry, only just to say, I, I know you're, you're, you're asking sort of thing for yes, no, but then we say space for further comments, the, the, especially question to it does, it, it's very much a sort of yes, no answer. It, it, it's not reading as you really want them to give more details. Do you, do, do you know what I mean? I'm just wondering yeah. whether we can avoid sort of yes, no answers and make it far more informative for us, you know? Yeah, we can take away the yes, no there and just say, please tell us whether or not you think this policy is a good idea and why. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be better than than limiting us like this, like, you know, with the years. Just my opinion, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, OK. Well, I think I think that you and David between you have, have raised a valid point, which is that we're not trying to get yes, no answers. We are trying to get something qualitative, really, yeah. that's going to help us make sure that this policy is going to be fit for purpose and effective. So we can certainly look at encouraging people to give us a fuller, you know, a more discursive response, can't we? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to check at this point that Joe is making notes about this discussion because that's difficult for me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, I am, Mary. I am. Thank you. Right, OK. I thought you'd be so pleased with it all that you'd be listening to me it all over again so you could write it down verbatim. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I won't be doing that. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> uh, right, I've got Peter and then Ryland. Peter? Hi again. Thank you, Mary. Um, we really are in danger of descending into the depths of pedantry. And being a pedant myself, I often enjoy such discussions. But in trying to be helpful, um, and try to get beyond the ambiguity that I think exists in question two at the moment, if you were to word it, do you think that the council having a policy on um, affordable credit is a good idea? Not is the policy a good idea, is the idea of having a policy on affordable credit a good idea and it then yeah a yes no if yes under b do you have any further comments to make about the policy uh, in terms of amending it or whatever because at the moment the way it's worded of course as we've said do you think this policy is a good yeah it's a good idea and then move on the point is is the content of the policy right and I don't think we should be put off by worries about language or whatever. A lot of people out there are actually quite well educated and can understand the document. So do you think that having the policy is a good idea? And if have you any suggestions to make in relation to it? Something like that, perhaps? Yeah, noted. Ryland? Hi. Um, trying to lift the discussion above pedantry. Um, thinking back to when the council has done work about debt and so on in the past, uh, one issue which was always extremely difficult to get around is that 
uh, some of the more um, examples of violence associated with money lending and that type of thing occurred in the Muslim community. And um, if you wanted to get um, an insight from the Muslim community about interest rates and, and debt and all that sort of stuff, I don't think that they would be particularly receptive to a questionnaire like this because generally speaking, um, in the past, they hadn't been prepared to engage with the council or the police or anything about um, debt and money lending because of the sort of religious issues within their community associated with debt and so on. Um, so although the, 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 the policy is well meaning, I do think that in, in the context of um, what the Muslim community, who, as I said, have been uh, on the receiving end of the, the sort of violence and so on associated with money lending, um, I doubt very much whether a questionnaire like this would in itself generate a, a response unless there was a significant amount of work done uh, with the Muslim community to sort of um, bring them on board um, to at least have the conversation. Because if we think back some years, the Muslim community wasn't engaging with any discussions with the council or the police in terms of um, money lending, high interest lending, anything like that. OK, um, well, the policy has been drafted and this committee did formally move it forward to be progressed down the machine of becoming formal council policy. The cabinet member has requested that it goes to consultation and the consultation is what we're here to discuss. So are you saying, Ryland, that there's, an, there's an, a different way of running the consultation that you think would be that would be more well, effective in engaging the Muslim community? Well, I'm just saying that when the consultation takes place, uh, some uh, cognizance needs to be taken of the needs of the Muslim community um, because they're the people that have had the sort of um, illegal, violent, money lending end of the spectrum um, in the past. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely mm. worth bearing in mind. Do you, do you think that the way that the questions on the survey are phrased is relevant to that? Or is it more a case that whatever it says on the survey, we're going to have to try and do that outreach and make sure that the voices of the Muslim community do get captured? Or whatever, whatever the whatever the questions, how they're worded, etc. Um, in this context, doesn't really matter. It's right. the, the outreach work uh, and the links for the Muslim community that will need to be made so that they do actually participate. In the okay. Field. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, we're, we're well placed. We've, we've got good links within the council, haven't we? We've got, you know, our um, community cohesion officer for the region is based here in Swansea. I'm sure he can give us some advice about how we how we take the consultation out to different communities and make sure that people have their say. Thanks, it, Ryan. It, it might be worth thinking um, previously when Alaska was in existence, they actually had um, products that were compliant with Muslim rules, etc. Um, yeah. And it may be that there is some work from that period that would be helpful in informing, or some links from that period that would be uh, helpful in taking this forward. What I would suggest is, um, <clears throat> so at the moment we're we're several steps away from action, aren't we? We're talking about at the moment we're just focusing on the consultation and then following the consultation hopefully the policy which which may undergo some changes and revisions will move forward and become adopted council policy and then we need to talk we actually take it forward and roll it out you know the action so i think what would be important is to make sure that in the action planning um, particular efforts are made to reach into the Muslim community and to talk about Sharia compliant products and things like that. So I think if we all make a note, if Joe makes a note for us now, um, that, that that's something we particularly want to mention, that when it comes into action planning, we think about um, how to promote Sharia compliant loans to people who would need them. That would be a good takeaway, wouldn't it? 
Um, OK, thanks, Ryland. David, you want him to come in again? I just wanted to pick up uh, on one point, I think. I don't think we should just have it that um, the, 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 those who've fallen into the hands uh, of illegal money lenders aren't entirely uh, contained within the Muslim community. It's, it's fairly widespread. And that's, it's one, that is one of the drivers and has been since we started doing this work in 2012. Uh, about why we need um, reasonable means of access to uh, affordable money to keep people out of criminality, not just the high interest rates. Um, is this survey to be anonymous or are we asking for people's names? We, we've asked people to offer their contact details if they would like to work with us in future if they would like to um, talk with us more about their ideas or experiences. Yeah, I'm not, it might work. I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure that I sort of agree with Ryland, I think. But I don't think we're going to get a very response about people wanting to openly talk to us about it. We need, I think, to have ways into the community to talk to people directly. Yeah. Um, which is slightly more difficult to do in, in terms of identifying, but we could use uh, food banks, we could use people in the community, um, offices and public um, community facilities to identify people who are likely to be helpful in consultation about debt. And that's not just necessarily about those who are actually in debt. <coughs> We, we have already started discussions with um, with Unison and with some of the local housing associations and our tenant participation officer about bringing people into our working groups who have experience of the council's debt collection processes to help us with our other piece of work that's going on, developing um, a debt recovery policy. Um, and mm. as, as those discussions pick up, I'm sure that they will also help us with this piece of work on, on promoting affordable credit. I think the, the survey isn't, I'm certainly not seeing this survey as our only way of reaching out to people. It's more that we are reaching out to people and we're hoping to involve them in our discussions. It's more that the, the survey presents an opportunity to invite people to contact us if they would like to get involved and that we welcome that. Christine. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I, I, I think we're getting there with the with, with the wording of this survey now, but I just like to add, really, I think that um, this is if you like the tip of the iceberg as far as um, uh, as debt and poverty and where people are um, certainly when when you bring everything that's due to happen in the next couple of months and in years and what and what have you together people are in for a, a, a difficult difficult time and as the council sort of pulled itself together to deal with the the covid virus um, we're also, we're also I feel, going, to going to have to do, do very similar to pull ourselves together and help our citizens with the out, you know, the the, the loss of jobs, the, um, the, the the crash of the economy and all and, and all the rest of it. I know that that's a huge thing that we're going to have to do, but certainly reading, you know, reading, reading what's coming up, that's. Um, you know, it's going to make a, a situation that's already difficult in Swansea far, far worse. Um, Alison, I noticed the um, the presentation that you sent out. What was it from? From the, um, I mean, the Welsh government looking at. Oh God, what's it called now? Finan um, financial something or other. I can't remember what it's called. It's written down there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really good at this, aren't I? 
Um, but certainly <laughs> it's something that's on the radar for, for Welsh Government is looking at um, people's financial health and well-being, put it, yes. put, put it that way. Um, the, the promotion of credit unions, of course, LASA um, stopped uh, working in August uh, 2018, wasn't it? And we've now got the Swansea Bay and the Leith Portal, but credit unions and, uh, you know, the umbrella of Celtic um, uh, credit unions. But as far as I can see, that certainly needs extra work, especially in Swansea. Uh, so, yeah, this policy is great. It talks about um, how Swansea deals with its own debtors. But I think that as far as... Um, uh, uh, as financial health and poverty and people in debt, we're, this this is probably just the tip of tip of the iceberg. So I th sorry sorry to bring everybody down, but I think I I have to add that it's it, th there's a storm coming our way, isn't there? Yeah, no, thank you, Christine. I think that's a really good observation. Um, you know, just just for members to be aware. I, I did have a meeting this morning with um, colleagues at the WLGA and the Bevan Foundation talking about all 22 local authorities sharing good practice and um, ways of streamlining the benefit system. There's a, a lot of uh, well, Wales specific benefits like free school meals and council tax reduction and pupil deprivation grant access, um, which could be made more streamlined and the passporting of, of people's entitlement could be working much more smoothly to um, reduce underclaiming. So everybody is aware of this situation and, and there's a lot of work needing to be done. I'm going to take a minute just to restate the purpose of this particular policy. Although the name of it is clumsy, it's promoting affordable credit policy. Let's be clear that from, from, from my point of view at least, this policy is making it clear that anybody who works for Swansea Council has an obligation to be constructive and helpful if anyone discloses that they're in financial difficulty. because. For too long, people have had an inconsistent response, depending on who they're talking to and depending on what they're talking about. And that, that actually hasn't been a policy up until now that would have prevented a council officer passing on the phone number of someone that they thought could help with money, who might turn out to be a loan shark. Right? We are actually, it, it, for me, it's a question of organisational culture. It's, it's trying to to get everybody who works for this organisation on the same page where we're saying debt hurts Swansea and we want everybody to be supported and there is free independent debt advice out there and there are better ways of borrowing money than you might be aware of. The action plan that will follow this, I mean you may remember that actually you know the, the cart did come before the horse a little bit with this because we already had a high interest lending action plan and we decided not to call it that because we don't want to plan for people to undertake high interest lending we want to, <laughs> we want to promote affordable credit instead but the high interest lending action plan um came before the policy and we decided to create the policy to make sure that that keeping a weather eye on um, high interest lending and trying to steer people away from it was something that the council would always do so that the policy really is a placeholder for those actions to do with promoting the credit union, loan shark awareness, steering people away from um, your rent to own shops and your doorstep lenders. But more than that, for me, it's about saying if somebody mentions to you that they're in financial difficulty, you as a representative of this organisation have an obligation to be helpful. You know, you, you set them up an appointment with um, citizen advice or money advice or shelter or whoever it is before they leave and make sure that they get some support. Um, and I think that that change in culture, we're already starting to see that change in culture because over the COVID period, you know, the usual sense of, of judgment and stigma that goes along with benefit claiming has softened because a lot of people, you know, amongst the ranks of our own officers and members and also just out there in the general public, people are a lot more sympathetic now to the fact that people's financial situations are precarious and people need support to understand their entitlements and, and to claim them. Um, 
So that's what I'm, I'm hoping that this policy, once we've actually got it through, is going to try and embed that culture where actually, you know, dealing with your debts and avoiding high interest credit and claiming everything you're entitled to is a matter of civic duty, you know, and we all try and support people to do it. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that we take the feedback that we've had on this discussion and we have one further working group meeting um, to thrash out and finalise the wording of the survey and then we can press this um, forward for public consultation. Is that all right with everybody? Can I just have some indication? Lindsay, you're going to give us some advice? Yes, I just wanted to make sure that um, I carefully looked through your terms of reference and the documents that are going out for consultation should be subject to a corporate report and I think that would need to go to cabinet before it goes out for consultation especially if it's if, as the correct proposal is is that it subsequently becomes a council policy so that would be the next step whatever you agree there would be a corporate report which of course would have financial uh, legal and equality implications in it and then that would go before the cabinet then for consideration and agreement to go out to consultation and then of course it would go back to cabinet after the consultation with the comments on the response on the consultation before then the report goes to council for final adoption i just wasn't right. sure if that was clear the way you were talking i wasn't sure whether the, after the working group it was just going to go be sent out i just wanted to make sure that there was another step to be done and part of that step of course is going to be identifying all the consultees be it individuals, be it stakeholders, be it groups, um, so then it's clear who it's gone to and it's been a full um, consultation. That was all I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I think um, the advice we had from Access to Services previously was that we should ask the Cabinet member whether she wanted there to be a consultation prior to it going to Cabinet. And she said that she would like there to be a consultation. Um, if you're now advising that we need a corporate report to take this to cabinet before it goes to consultation, that's fine. <laughs> we can, we, I'm sure we can, we can move that forward while we're carrying on our discussions about the form that the consultation should take. So um, perhaps we can. I mean, we already we already moved at, at a previous formal meeting that this policy was going to be taken forward through the corporate machinery towards adoption. So I don't think we need to um, vote on that again. That's already been voted on. Um, so Joe can just go on and submit that corporate report. Mm -hmm. oh, is that OK, Joe? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next item on the agenda then. Um, Anthony is going to take us through a presentation explaining the changes to TV licensing for the over 75s. And I know that he's also going to be mentioning other stuff to do with TV licensing that's not specific to the over 75s. Um, what I would like members to be thinking about while we're listening to Anthony is which bits of this presentation is it important that we try and disseminate more widely and how might we want to take that forward? OK, over to you, Tony. Thanks. OK, thank you, Mary. Um, good afternoon, all. I think I think you all know me. So uh, if you don't, it's uh, Anthony Richards um, from the Tackling Poverty Service. I'm going to Mary, I'm going to request control of the screen so that I can um, share the presentation. And just looking to share that now. OK, hopefully you can all see that. Yep, great. OK, so yeah, as Mary said, um, I'm going to talk you through a brief presentation um, about the changes that have taken place this year regarding uh, TV licenses uh, and the available support uh, that is in place um, by TV licenses uh, and the agencies that they work with. Uh, I'm also going to touch 
briefly on uh, pension credit, which is uh, a, a particular um, topic in, in relation to this. And when we're talking about the over 75s. So free TV licenses for all over 75s came to an end this year. From 1st of August, anyone aged 75 or over who is not in receipt of pension credit now needs to pay for their TV license. Pension credit is a financial top up um, for pensioners on low incomes. Anyone who's 75 or over and in receipt of pension credit can apply for a free TV license. The pension credit needs to be in their name or their partner's name if living at the same address. And it's not included on the slides, um, but just in case anyone was wondering, the cost of an annual TV license uh, currently is £157.50. Uh, as I said, I, I would like to touch on um, pension credit here a little bit, and this is uh, this this will be of, of particular interest, I hope. Um, this slide shows um, data from uh, the Department for Work and Pensions um, estimate of benefit take up from 2018. It was published in um, February this year. And what we see there, if we focus on the left hand side where it says pension credits, the DWP actually has two ways of estimating pension credit take up. So looking at the graphic there where we can see the blue people and the, and the grey people, this is number one in terms of the ways that, that, that they um, estimate take up. Um, and this is the number of people who claim out of the total that are eligible. So there we've got six out of 10 people, 60%. So that's four eligible for for eligible uh, people out of 10 are currently not claiming pension credit. And then looking at the text below on the left hand side, uh, this refers to the other way that, that uh, the DWP uh, measures take up. And this is to do more with the amount of money that has been claimed. So here we see that 70% of the total amount of pension credit that could have been claimed was claimed. OK, so um, TV licensing have um, have introduced a new payment scheme called the 75 plus plan. And what that scheme does, it allows the cost of the license to be spread out with no additional charges. Uh, this scheme is for people aged 75 plus and were who were previously covered by a free TV license. Uh, and these payments then can be made can be made monthly, fortnightly, or weekly. I'm next going to talk about um, so that that was um, a brief overview of the changes in terms of uh, TV licenses for 75s and over. What I'm going to talk about now, uh, and just for clarity, is um, uh, the TV licenses simple payment plan. Now I want to be clear that this isn't in relation to 75s and over, this is in relation to, to anyone. I think that's an important point to make. I don't expect you to read this here. The presentation will be circulated uh, after, so I'll just, I'll just talk you through it. So the simple payment plan uh, was launched on the 1st of April this year, and it's targeted at those who are in financial difficulty. Qualifying customers can, can choose from fortnightly or monthly payments, spreading the cost over 12 months for the license. It offers flexibility if a payment is missed. Missed payments would be spread across the remainder of the plan rather than doubling for the next payment that is due. Um, any, and then it does state there that customers who are removed from the plan, if the, uh, sorry, let me rephrase, customers are, are removed from the plan if three pay, consecutive payments have been missed. So in order to, um, for people to take up the, um, the simple payment plan, um, it's, it's done via referrals. So, Anyone can make a referral, so frontline workers, counsellors, uh, anyone who's supporting people can make a referral, but that referral has to be made to uh, a debt advice uh, charity. 
it's that debt advice charity then that would be engaging with the individual and they can um, apply for them or support them to apply uh, for the simple payment plan. Um, so there are organisations both locally and nationally um, who can support that. Um, so locally here in Swansea, we've got Citizens Advice and Christians Against Poverty, both of which are licensed to give uh, debt advice. And then nationally, you've got the National Debt Line, Step Change and the Money Advice Service. That ends the presentation, Mary. So I'll edit out, come out of that and I'll give you back control of the screen. Bear with me, my computer's a little slow. Tony, I'll just open this all up for questions. So, David, you have your hand up? I've got two questions. Um, I know it's not your slide, um, Anthony, but uh, it talks about Christians against poverty. Do we not have it for people who aren't Christians? Marlon was talking about Muslims. They, they surely have advice agencies and shouldn't they be on that leaflet as well? Um, and the other one was, I didn't understand, again, I know it's not your slide, but I didn't understand the first slide. The first slide says one of two things, or there's two ways that slide can be read. 60% of, of eligible people claim 70% of the money, or 60% of the people who were eligible to claim only claimed 70% of the money they were eligible to have. Which one, which is it? The first. <laughs> it's the first of those two, isn't it? So, um, but 60% of the people claim 70% of the money. Apparently, yes. Apparently. The thing is, we're dealing with statistics that well, get well, rounded. Oh, well, yeah, but if 60% of the people claim 70% of the money, it must mean that they're claiming more than they're entitled to. I think that you're, you're probably combining two different sets of stats that aren't really supposed to be combined. The, the fact is that the DWP has two different ways of estimating take up, two different ways. So one way is that they work out how many people are eligible and they report on how many, what percentage of those people do claim. That's called the caseload estimate, I think. So by that measure, six out of ten people who are eligible are claiming and then you put all that to one side and you look at the more financial estimate and I can't remember the official name of that but that is where they look at the total amount that they think should be being claimed and they work out the proportion of that which is actually going out the door and they've estimated it to be 70 percent so that they're two different sets of stats that don't necessarily relate to each other I agree with your conclusion that, you know, on the face of it, it looks as though 60% of the people eligible are claiming 70% of the pot. But it's probably best for statistical reasons not to combine the two estimates. It's either that 60% of the people eligible are claiming or it's that 70% of the eligible money is going out. And um, yeah, Christians Against Poverty are just a really well-known and effective and well-respected debt advice charity, and they provide debt advice to anybody. Um, but that is the official name of the charity, um, and they're listed by the TV licensing people. That slide that listed those debt advice organisations, I believe Anthony lifted it straight from the, F the TV licensing website. Um, so those are the organisations that we know are already recognised by TV licensing as appropriate organisations to signpost people for the simple payment plan. But we also know that they have other ways of working um, and that they have other referrers who were not listed on, on there. And I'm sure if there was a charity that was properly um, accredited um, that did provide debt advice, they would take referrals from them as well. Are there any other questions for Tony specifically on his presentation before we have a bit of a discussion? I've got nothing to add in terms of you answered those questions from David. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mary. <laughs> OK, <laughs> OK, good. Um, so the overall.
overriding concern for me is that we still have such a huge problem with pension credit underclaiming. And, you know, pension credit um, means more to people than a free TV license. It means it means a lot more than a free TV license. Um, but what I was wondering when I first saw that presentation, I was wondering, could the prospect of a free TV license be used as a bit of an additional push to try and encourage people to look into whether they were eligible for pension credit and missing out. Um, pension credit can make a massive difference to, to household incomes. So uh, that's that's one thing. In general, we need to be trying to encourage uptake of pension credit and perhaps the prospect of a, TV, a free TV licence could help us there. And the other thing then is about the simple payment plan and making sure that council officers and councillors who might work with people who are struggling financially could say to somebody, you might, you might be able to get help with your TV licence, you might be able to spread your TV licence over a longer period, but in order to do that, you need to get referred to the simple payment plan by a recognised debt advice charity. And that would be no bad thing, because if somebody is struggling in whatever respect, then an assessment from a debt advice charity could could be really, really helpful for them. Christine. Thank you, Chair. It, it just struck me that the T, I, this isn't necessarily council, but it's maybe something that we could push up the line. The TV licensing are writing to everybody about their TV licenses. Shouldn't they or couldn't they also within that when they're writing to the over 75s be mentioning pension credit? Uh, I know it's, um, you know, it's probably not strictly their, their, their business, but it would surely be the most effective way of highlighting it to everybody over 75 who may well be entitled to be claiming pension credit. Just a thought that struck me now. Yeah, I agree. And I think that uh, Tony and I can make contact with the TV licensing people who provided that presentation and, and uh, have a conversation with them about that. Yeah. Tony, you wanted to come in? Oh, sorry, Chris, you've gone on to mute. Are you done? <laughs> no, sorry. I mean, as far as the council's concerned, we are also, we write to people every year about the council tax. I mean, that again... I'm 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 perhaps just you know um, making assumptions, but based on the over over seventy fives that I know, they take particular note of of bills that come into the house from the council. Um, you know, information in there about pe pension credits would probably be useful as well. So yeah, um, great, thanks. Tony, did you want to come in? Or yeah. yeah, if I can, I thought it might be worth mentioning, Mary, just for context for the rest of the group, because obviously we sat through um, a presentation. So an organisation called Equinox um, have been tasked by TV licensing um, to promote the changes uh, in terms of communication in, in different organisations um, across across Wales. And we've sat, we uh, attended a presentation where we were, we were talked through this in more detail than we've given you an overview uh, today. But I just thought it'd be worth um, for awareness, you knowing that we are also promoting those that presentation and engagement with Equinox because they are in, they are keen to engage with as many organisations as possible. So we put it out through um, the Swansea Poverty Partnership Forum, uh, Flash Inclusion Steering Group. Um, just to try and get the um, get engagement or uh, convey the invitation to receive that presentation direct from Equinox to the various organisations that are supporting people across Swansea. Um, I, I just thought it'd be worth mentioning that, Mary, just to give that that, that context. There. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so. Um... Members may be aware that there has been some effort made by our internal welfare rights team to drive uptake on pension credit. Um, they were able to ask uh, the revenues and benefits team to kind of have a, a sift through the benefit data that they hold and identify households that they thought were probably under claiming pension credit. Um, so there was there were some letters sent out and people were invited to get in touch 
with some help. And I know that Alison circulated um, today uh, an email to councillors sharing some of the results from just one phone call um, where a couple's income was basically doubled, I think. Um, so I think, yeah, generally we need to be looking at any opportunity we can to flag up pension credit and to, to try and encourage people to claim it. The, there's a letter, a letter went out um, and letters are still going out. I have a bit of an update to share with you shortly from Julian Morgans about, about the council tax um, letter. So a letter went out which was very carefully written to encourage anybody who was in arrears with their council tax to contact the authority and talk about their situation. Um, and then the priority is to see if there's anything that they're missing out on. So I don't think that letter did specifically mention pension credit, but I'm sure that pension credit would be one of the things that they would look for. Um, but but you're right, Chris, I, I can't see why we wouldn't put a note in, say, with the council tax bill itself, saying, you know, pension credit is seriously underclaimed. And, you know, so I think we need to perhaps think about some messaging that we'd like to put out to try and drive up the take of that. Uh, Alison, you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Only, I, I, I know you all know I'm passionate about welfare rights, um, but I just, I, I keep putting these things out uh, and the messages out throughout the council, but it really concerns me that our, our councillors are not referring into welfare rights, that, you, you, you know, we, We've got a lot of work to do with the local area coordinators as well. It's only a handful sort of referring, but we've, we hope we come around that now. We've, we've allocated a welfare rights officer actually to the LACs, so that may overcome that. But within our huge body of, of councillors, there's hardly anybody refers in. And I don't know whether people are afraid, thinking that they've got to, that if they referred in, they would have to take on the work. But as a councillor, that doesn't happen. The welfare rights team will take over that work and they will just keep you in the loop. So there's nothing to be afraid of. You, you know, we, we have that safety net that the welfare rights officers will take that over. So somehow we do, just got to get the message out that people should be referring in because when the officers then do a check on whatever, they will pick up anything that they are missing because we know that EWP don't tell people what they're missing. Do you know I mean? So we, we, as councillors, we've got to get people referred in. I can't stress it enough. So if this, if if your PDC Mary can do something to drive that home, I, I think then it can only benefit people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. I I definitely take that point. I think um, I can feel something brewing, which is you know, some kind of a presentation or letter, some kind of communication to the whole council or body um, about how to refer to the welfare rights team, when to refer to the welfare rights team, and perhaps some particular markers to look out for. So how would you know that somebody was under claiming pension credit? The reason why pension credit is such an easy one to tackle is that actually the eligibility is very, very clear. So um, it would be good to perhaps share a few lines with councillors about how they could spot potential under claiming. Um, and ways that they can, yeah, direct people to further support. David, you wanted to come in? I just wanted to pick up on Alison's point, really. I give it a slightly different emphasis. I don't think you could assume that because councillors don't do it, they're failing to do it. I don't, well, in a particular way, I, I don't recall in all my years as a councillor ever being approached about the question that I've that I've ever been asked I need to get more money how do I do that uh, I've, I've never people have never come to me about issues about their personal finances but that said I think there's another way of looking at that which is that perhaps if we're encouraging you're taking your earlier comments Mary about council officers who, who, who fail to pick up and deal with the area in which they are specifically employed rather than taking the wider horizon. If you're in debt, if you're having problems with payments about this, you might be having problems about payments about everything and why that might be. That we as councillors perhaps 
should also be encouraged that when we are contacted by people, take a wider view about is there an issue potentially here about debt and having some sort of question format, not about, you know, are you hard up? Something a little more subtler and, but because it's just something that occurred to me, I don't, when I'm dealing with people, I'm dealing with the issue that they present. I'm, I'm not really digging behind that to go, well, are there other issues? It's happened once or twice when I've been to see people, but over the telephone and so on, I, it, it, or in the surgeries, rarely, rarely happens. And I think there is a perhaps uh, a, a means we could be encouraging counsellors to actually say, be a little more um, proactive in when you're you're having intervention with constituents to check up, particularly the elderly ones, that they, they are getting their full entitlement. Yeah. All good points. Thank you very much, David. So I think um, Equinox is going to be sending Anthony some some social media output that they've created. Um, I'm not sure what that says exactly, but I would suggest that certainly when council comms get hold of it or councillors get hold of it, they could share it on with a con. You know, please make sure that you're claiming pension credit because it could save you the cost of your TV license. Um, and perhaps that 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 could be something that's um, quite an obvious action. And perhaps we can in a in a later working group meeting, we can talk about how else we would like to push this discussion about encouraging councillors to promote benefit take up. OK. So I'm mindful of time, we've got just over 10 minutes left and the next thing on the agenda is our, our work plan. So I'm not I'm not actually proposing a detailed discussion about the work plan, and um, but just verbal updates on work in progress, if that's OK. Um, so I think I'm going to hand over to, to Joe for that, I think. Um, we've got some progress to report on the green fairness policy um, and then also between between them Joe and Tony I think will give us a bit of an update on the corporate debt policy okay thanks Okay, um, so in relation to the green fairness policy, that's progressing sort of very well. We've um, established a working group, which um, also includes um, external partners, the Environment Centre, um, our working with nature team. And so really they've taken the policy and they've sort of like refined sort of various uh, words and included sort of more sort of activity. So I think it's got a really nice shape to it now. In fact, Mary was wondering actually what we want to do with the policy now, whether it needs to come back to the committee or whether it needs to be shared with the relevant cabinet members for them to have a look um, because I've, I've incorporated all of Phil's comments now so I think we're at that stage where you know it needs to be shared again so okay I would say let's share it on with the committee we'll have a working group discussion and then we'll decide what to do with it next okay okay, okay. Um, and then how about the corporate debt policy? Tony? Yes, Mary. So um, work is underway. We are, we are at draft stage of uh, a court personal uh, debt, corporate personal debt policy. Um, myself and Mary have been um, having a little bit of back and forth in terms of um, some in very initial drafts. Uh, Julian uh, Morgans has also uh, provided um, a, a kind of starting point as well in terms of a draft. Um, so we are looking to combine um, kind of officer agreement in terms of what might be uh, a good draft uh, version of the policy to bring to bring back to PDC. Uh, but that work that work was put on hold really um, during the, the pandemic. I mean, I would like that to be further along. Uh, but the pandemic, the coron coronavirus pandemic, has uh, delayed things um, in terms of uh, other priorities that came up uh, over the last few months. But I'm pleased to say that um, we are moving forward with with that again now, and it's it's back on the agenda. So I'm really happy with that. 
Is there anything you want me to add to that, there, Mary? No, I think I'll just uh, see if any if any members have got any questions on either the green fairness policy or the corporate debt policy at the moment. OK, no. OK, thanks. Thanks both. I have got an update. I did invite Julian Morgans to come and give us a little verbal update, and I'm afraid he's he's not able to be here, but he's given me some information to share with you. Um, you may be aware that all debt collection was put on hold um, during lockdown. I'd be sympathetic to our community undergoing financial difficulties during this pandemic. Um, and then a council tax letter was put out, which was um, designed deliberately to be very a very gentle invitation to people to get in touch and see if we could help. Um, and it was sent out to people in council tax arrears. So I have got an update from Julian. So in total, there are about 10,000 letters to go out um, and they're currently issuing 350 a day. So they started out doing 250 a day and they increased that once they assessed that they were able to, to deal with responses coming in. And so far, they're about halfway through the 10,000. So they did start with the people owing the most arrears, which would be for larger properties or second homes. And there was a very low response rate in that group. But they're now dealing with what what you would call, you know, more normal amounts of arrears, just your normal home homeowners and people who, who slip line with their payments. And so the response is picking up. Um, so it's unlikely that they'll be increasing the number of letters going out each day. It's going to probably stay at around 350 a day. So some people have already been referred to citizens advice for advice and support, and they report back that the appointments are being arranged within a week. So that seems to be working really well and we're waiting for an update from citizens advice about how that's going um i'm i'm always glad to hear that people have been referred to citizens advice because as we've been discussing in this meeting they'll do a comprehensive benefit check and income maximization exercise as well as dealing with problem debt so that's really the best thing that could happen to somebody is to be referred to them um and obviously, Julian reports that uh, they are encouraging those in difficulty to apply for council tax reduction um, and checking that any tax and exemptions that should have been awarded have been awarded. Um, Julian says it's too early at the moment to see if income to the authority has increased um, or if applications for council tax reduction have further increased. But um, really, the exercise was mainly designed to generate a discussion and, and get some contact from people. And it definitely has done that. It has increased our direct contact with council taxpayers, which is really good. And um, council tax is estimated to be down around 2.8% on last year. So for the whole year's council tax income, that's £3.8 million. And we're hoping that this will improve, but obviously we don't know what's going to be happening next. The council tax reduction caseload has already gone up by around 700. And I know that that's, that's small potatoes compared to the universal credit claims. So it seems to me, I'm sure Alison will comment as well, there's a bit of a mismatch there. UC claims have gone up much more than that. And you would expect anyone who's claiming UC to be claiming CTR as well. So I think that we still have some work to do in promoting council tax reduction and encouraging uptake of that help. Alison, since you're here, I'm sorry I haven't asked you to prepare anything, but um, is there anything you'd like to share with us about the impact of lockdown on, on benefits and employment and stuff like that locally in the last five well, minutes? Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll be doing, it, it's, it, it's been really hard out there and, and you, you know, it's going to get worse. There's no two ways about it. And when furlough scheme ends at the end of October, we're expecting, you know, even more referrals. We know that we were just talking about universal credit, that there's been 15,000 universal credit claims alone in Swansea um, throughout these last couple of months. You, you know, um, for a lot of people, it gets very confusing out there. And a lot of people are very nervous also of swapping from when they were on legacy benefit over to universal credit, it, it all becomes very sort of frightening because they're afraid that they could be worse off, you, you know, um, and that, therefore back to the welfare scheme that we talked about earlier to support us, you, you know, but po poverty, I think, is 
going to be like we've never seen in our lifetime now, you, you, you know, as more people get more redundant. The employability teams um, have sort, sort of identified with the DWP that they will work, take the vast, the huge volumes that are coming through in cohorts um, with a priority being our elite, so young people, and our long term unemployed, um, you know, and inactive sort of furthest removed from work because unfortunately they become an even more further removed from work now as more and more skilled people get made redundant, they take the next sort of jobs down, you know. Um, on saying that, the employability teams, uh, you know, have been able to turn around about a third at the moment back into jobs um, uh, for people, not albeit different jobs, you, you know, but, um, but some of the work is there. And the mentors have been doing some fantastic work in getting people ready for work and the CVs. And I think if, if you all go on Swansea Council's website now, you will see um, Swansea working on there. And it's a fantastic piece of work that's gone into it. And it's got all different um, ways of supporting people and, and access there. And really, we, should, we need to be promoting that. So people, because for lots of people, you might not have written a CV in a long time. And a lot of people don't realize that you have to tailor your CVs to every job you apply for. You, you, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite difficult out there. And we're forcing people to be digital. And we know a lot of people haven't got, even got that ability at the moment, you know. Um, very worried about lifelong learning and the sort of essential skills, you, you know, because it's far more than somebody just come into a classroom. You know, that person who is, who is unable to read or write or very limited, they often bring their letters in, they bring their bills, they bring, the teachers do so much more than, you, you know. And so, unfortunately, COVID is it now most vulnerable, isn't it? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Um, and making it even harder for people. But, like I said, we just now need to work with the teams that are really working hard to make a difference out there, you, you know, and, you know, Anthony is here and he works, you know, flat out trying to look at all aspects of poverty and the Food Poverty Network is about to start up now. And I think that, you know, it's so ready for it, you know, so, um, so yeah, it has been quite doom and gloom and very sad. You, you know, and people claiming universal credit and ringing in saying, you know, this surely can't be what I've got to live on. This can't be, can't be right, you, you know. But unfortunately, it is awful. It is shocking. And all the people that are out there that have thought that people live high on the hog with when they're claiming benefits, I think there's been a bit of a reality check for many people now when suddenly that universal credit doesn't even cover the mortgage. Yeah, you know, so, um, but yeah, so, yeah, sorry, doom and gloom, but excellent work going on, Mary, really, really excellent work within the local authority and the third sector, you know, yeah. so uh, we just got to keep pulling together. Ooh, have I frozen or is Mary frozen? I think it might be Mary. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, she probably has. Oops, I think we've lost her, have we? Mm. Anybody got any questions for me why Mary's frozen and trying to come back in? Uh, no thanks, Alison. But the the stuff that you're sending out, the uh, emails that we've had from you, there's a lot of good information in there, and I hope people are reading them. That's all I can say. Yeah. And me, Christine. And me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to apologise and go now. I've got another Teams meeting at five o'clock. <laughs> the joys. I see you, and see if that will work. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Ta -da. Okay. Ta -da, Christine. Uh, right, Ryland, as Mary has uh, uh, dropped out, uh, do you want to continue as chair? 
Good thing I'm listening, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, does anybody want to ask any questions on what Alison just uh, said about the benefits situation? No. There's only me and David and uh, Peter Jones left of the councillors, I think. Um, on that basis, um, oh. Mary Jones has back. come back in. <laughs> I'm back. I don't know what happened there. Sorry. Internet again, I think. Sorry. Okay. Well, I was I was I was only I was only going to wrap up. <laughs> Um, and, and thank Alison. I know it. I know it is doom and gloom, and I know that the um, employability team is dealing with a huge caseload, and everyone's doing their best. Um, this is the last formal PDC meeting of this um, artificially lengthened municipal year. Um, so, the council um, annual meeting is this week, and there may be changes to the committee. So, I did want to close today by thanking this committee for all the work that we've done over the last year. Um, and, and hoping to see some of you on the other side. Um, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether I'll be remaining in the chair. I think I missed a call from the leader while we were having our meeting. Um, but I, I know that we've started some really good things in train that hopefully will be finished soon. Um, and I, I want to thank um, Andrew Davis, who sent his apologies today. But I, I think as a co-opty, his a contribution has been um, very valuable as well. So, so thank you all. And I think with that, um, I'll close the meeting. Unless I just ask before you, I just ask before you do close the yeah. meeting. Is the meeting on yeah. Thursday afternoon after the council meeting? Is that just the formal one about the electing officers of the committee? It's a, yeah, it's for the yeah. committee. It's for the newly for the newly formed committee to elect the chair and deputy chair. Yeah. Right. It seems so. Um, um, Big gap between the council date time and the start of the PDC. Yes, I, I can't comment on that, David. I don't know how that timetabling was decided. But yeah, yes, that's, down, that's, down to, that's down to practicalities eh, for okay. setting up the, the individual meetings for the PDCs. Is, is five or six meetings, so that's just down to practicalities. Well, well, they, as they would do live, just follow on from each other or are we obligated because these are online meetings to have them at the, at the Times Diary? Um, I think it's, it's see, see where it goes on the day, really. Um, yeah, we've got, you've got to have a set time, so it'll be ample time for, every, for, for the chair, vice chair to be elected and then on to the next one then, so it'll follow an order. That's, that's okay. the plan. Right, we'll, we'll call it a close there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Mary. See you soon. Cheers. Bye.